What's going on, Core Consult fam? So today I want to talk about asthma and uh, kind of review the new updated guidelines um, put out by uh, Gina. And um, it was put out in 2019, I believe in April. And so uh, this ho hopefully at this point is old news to you. But if it's not, we're definitely going to go back through it and see what you think. And for the new A-type people who are looking at the slides and you see PharmD all capitalized, uh, know that that was just more so laziness uh, to change the font, not that I don't know how to put PharmD properly. So in case you were wondering, there that is. All right. So uh, we know asthma, it's a disease that affects the lungs, it affects the, the bronchi, and it's basically just this um, chronic airway inflammation um, that eventually can lead to bronchoconstriction um, due to the inflammation. So we're going to limit some of the expiratory airflow. Um, we're also going to typically see wheezing. Um, patients will experience chest tightness, a lot of coughing, breath breathlessness. Um, and, you know, the intensity of these definitely can vary depending on how severe the symptoms are or whether or not they're having exacerbation. And then we can hopefully use medication to limit some of those um, symptoms. Um, really, the... Um, the symptoms can occur um, often at night um, or when you first wake up, and a lot of times patients will, will describe them as being worse um, during those hours. Um, there are also uh, symptoms can be triggered by certain activities such as like exercise, um, even laughter can, can uh, trigger an asthma attack. Um, that's not great if you're laughing at something hilarious and then you end up having an asthma attack. That's not as funny, but... Um, can, can definitely exacerbate one. So um, allergens, we kind of could imagine that. And then cold air can also cause problems. And then uh, obviously if somebody has some sort of infection, um, then it's going to make the symptoms worse as well. So here's a, a diagram, kind of a very long uh, convoluted way of showing what's going on as far as the inflammatory process. Um, so, you know, we're going to have uh, eosinophils, um, playing a role, you'll see um, the mucus glands um, being overly produced, so you get this hyperplasia, um, that ends up leading to these things called mucus plugs. Um, you also can get hyperplasia of glo uh, globulet cells, um, which in then can lead to the thickening of this basement membrane. Ba basically, all this slide is trying to explain is that you are dealing with an inflammation issue as opposed to something like COPD, which is more um, an obstruction of some kind. And so this is a true like inflammation um, issue. And when I, the reason I bring that up is because when we look at the treatment options, knowing that we're treating inflammation is uh, important when we think of asthma. So just real quick, some environmental factors that we have to think about. Um, also some comorbid conditions that can, can be triggers. So things like uh, allergens, like I already mentioned, um, some specifics would be like grass, certain types of uh, weeds, dust mites, animal dander, cockroaches. I'm pretty sure we're all probably allergic to those. And then um, fungal spores as well. Um, some of the irritants that we see, tobacco smoke, definitely, um, even if it's secondhand smoke. So if it's a child that has asthma and the parents smoking in the house can definitely cause problems. Um, occupational exposures, you know, people that are around some dust, paint, things like that can cause problems. And, um, and then exercise can also trigger it, but stress as well. So when someone's under extreme stress. Um, and then certain medications, um, aspirin, NSAIDs, things like that can, can cause problems. And then obviously infections, so rhinovirus, influenza, different viruses like that. Um, you know, bacterial sinus infection can cause issues as well, or pneumonia, things like that. Um, but also uh, patients that have things like uh, GERD or patients that are obese, um, especially if they have things like obstructive sleep apnea, uh, those are all sort of comorbid conditions that would put someone at risk for having more, you know, asthma attacks or exacerbations than uh, we would expect. And so we have to kind of keep uh, that in mind, look at the whole patient and all of their comorbidities, not just the um, asthma itself. So looking at some of the diagnostic criteria for asthma, and this is definitely in its simplest form probably, but um, you know, looking at um, a peak expiratory flow rate, um, so using spirometry um, is definitely a way of diagnosing. Um, so there's a few different terms to be aware of. So forced expiratory volume in one second, or FEV1. Um, that's found using spirometry. 
it's definitely uh, more reliable than things like peak um, expiratory flow using a peak flow meter, which we'll talk about in a second. But um, finding out what the patient's FEV1 is one aspect that we need. We also need to look at the maximum volume of air exhaled after taking a deep breath in, um, which is known as the FVC. Um, and then the FEV1, again, is the amount of air that can be forcefully exhaled, um, exhaled in one second. Um, and so these are measured at baseline, and then they are also measured after the patient has been given some sort of a short-acting bronchodilator, probably like an albuterol. Um, and then they test for reversibility to see how quickly uh, those numbers can change um, and become uh, more favorable uh, after the albuterol. So there's also uh, FEV1 um, over FVC, which is the percentage of total air capacity that can be forcefully exhaled in one second. So those are some, some quick definitions, but again, spirometry is what we're going to use to kind of diagnose asthma. And then, um, you know, as far as interpret, you know, interpreting those lung function tests, um, a low FEV1 um, percent predicted, which is, again, usually asked after they give a bronchodilator, um, they it, they use that as to kind of identify patients at risk um, for asthma exacerbations. So even if the patient is not necessarily um, symptomatic, like we would typically think, um, especially if their FEV1 is less than 60, um, they are definitely at higher risk for having exacerbation. Um, and it's a, a low FEV1 is definitely a risk factor um, for lung function decline. Again, even if the symptoms are not present currently. Um, and then a normal or high FEV1 in a patient with frequent respiratory symptoms, um, especially when they're actually symptomatic, um, would prompt you to kind of consider an alternative cause of those symptoms. So, for example, someone could have cardiac uh, disease like um, systolic heart failure or um, reduced ejection fraction heart failure, rather. Um, uh, cough uh, could be from just like, you know, post nasal drip, something simple, or it could be, um, you know, as the person's having uh, acid reflux. There's a whole bunch of other things that could be causing those symptoms. So if the FEV is normal or high, make sure you're looking for some sort of alternative diagnos uh, diagnosis. And then this is something a patient can kind of keep with them uh, at home, um, a peak flow meter. And basically it's to help kind of establish whether or not they're having uh, an asthma attack or not and to help them keep track of how well controlled their asthma is. So green zone is going to be 80 to 100% of personal best. Um, typically they do this three times in a setting and then take the best score of, of the three. Um, there's also the yellow zone, which is 50 to 80% of personal best, which would indicate some caution. And then if their patient is in the red zone, which is less than 50% of their personal best, um, that's when they need to start like their action plan and uh, get to the, the doctor's office or hospital to start getting um, treated for a potential exacerbation. Um, another thing that they can uh, use is like questionnaires kind of thing to in order to uh, go through and, and they can check this off and see how well controlled their asthma is over time. So if it starts to uh, decline, um, then you know we can uh, make sure that they get they get seen quicker than maybe we anticipated. So something simple that they could be doing from home. All right, so. <clears throat> Looking at treatment options, this is the uh, updated um, algorithm. And again, um, I want you to pay attention. This is from the GINA guidelines. This is for 12 years and older. We're not going to go through um, the 6 to 12, the 6 to 11 year olds, and then also the 5 and younger. Um, we can save that for another day. But this is 12 years and older. Um, these are the new guidelines, and they look it looks similar as far as the way it's set up um, compared to the old ones. But this the steps are significantly different, um, and especially the the rescue inhaler is uh, option is very different. So we'll get into this in a second. But I do want to kind of just go through some of the classes just to kind of review. Um, but we're going to get through um, or talk about this after we go through the classes and figure out where all these different medications kind of fall in, in with the therapy. All right, so the first thing that is really important, I think it's often overlooked, is selecting the inhaler device. 
So there's several different types of inhalers. We have, you know, the regular meter dose inhaler. We have a dry powdered inhaler. Uh, we have things like the Ellipta. We have the Respimat. There's several different types of inhaler. Um, and then we have other, like, random ones like... Um, the Aerosphere, the Bevesby that it has, uh, the Aerosphere, which it looks like a meter dose inhaler, but they have a cool name for it, so that's neat. Um, but there's lots of different inhalers, so we need to find one that is, you know, appropriate for that particular patient. So, um, you know, the, the, the actual um, skill of knowing how to use the device is something that um, there's been some studies that have showed as, as much as 80% of patients cannot use their inhaler correctly. So they may not be getting the full uh, potential of the inhaler. They may not be getting the dose at all. Um, I'll give you an example of, for those of you who are familiar with Spiriva handy inhaler, um, I had a patient one time who um, told me that his inhaler wasn't working. He didn't get any relief from it. He was taking it every single day. And uh, so I had him show me how it, it, you know, he uses it. He took the, because the Spiriva hand inhaler, you have to put a capsule in the inhaler, puncture it, and then breathe in the powder from the capsule. So this gentleman throws the capsule back in his mouth, swallows it, and then puts the inhaler up to his mouth and starts breathing in, but there's nothing in there. And so uh, we kind of real quickly got to the reason as to why his inhaler was not working well. So um, just because you think it's a very simple thing, because you've seen it a hundred times, a um, thousand times, whatever, uh, make sure the patient is familiar with it, even if it seems like a, a no-brainer. Anyways, um, you know, make sure you're choosing the uh, appropriate device for the patient. And then also, um, you know, follow up with them and check their technique uh, whenever you can. Again, make sure they're still doing it correctly. Make sure they're, you know, check, have them bring their inhaler in. You can check their dose counter, see if they're actually using it and all that fun stuff. Um, but then, you know, have them actually, it's easy to get demo devices, have them actually use that in the office or pharmacy or whatever you're using and um, have them actually, you know, demonstrate in front of you so you can see. Um, there's also uh, a website you can look at. Um, so geneasthma.org um, and the admit website, admit um, slash inhalers.org um, are available if you have questions at all about, you know, how to use certain devices and all that fun stuff. All right. So, um, asthma, um, the uh, meter dose inhalers that we have, um, the slide got a little messed up, I think, but, um, I'll come, I'm not sure why it looks like that, but we'll, uh, we'll fix it anyway. Um, asthma, um, meter dose inhalers is going to be, um, like a, uh, aerosolized liquid medication that um, will use some sort of a propellant to get the medication out um, into the patient. So this is going to typically require like a slow, deep um, inhalation at the same time as the patient presses the canister. So there's a little bit of coordination that is needed there. So this is, you know, could be potentially difficult for patients that have, you know, maybe like Parkinson's disease or, or young kids for that matter. Um, so there's issues that can kind of spring up there. Um, a dry powdered inhaler, so you see the picture on the left of this messed up slide, um, is the Pro Air RespiClick. Um, this is a dry powdered inhaler, so the, the difference between that is there's no propellant in here. The, the medication's in powder form, and the patient does have to breathe in forcefully in order to get that medication into their lungs. Um, so it's something that, uh, again, they have to have the lung capacity to be able to actually do that. Um, and then the RespiClick just for food for thought, um, the device itself, if you open the cap, that kind of uh, gets the dose ready. And then if you don't use that dose, if you just close the cap, it sort of just wastes that dose and it can actually um, get stuck in the device itself and can cause problems. So um, the Ellipta that you see right next to it, um, that's a device that if you open it and then close it, you did waste a dose, but it's on this kind of like uh, this um, circle uh, dosing thing so that it actually just will rotate to the next one and there won't actually be a dose stuck in the, you know, so you're not doubling up on the dose. So in my opinion, this is totally just my opinion, um, Ellipta is a lot easier to use if you're going to use a dry powder inhaler, but that's just me. Um, they also have uh, things like the uh, nebulizers that we can use, and so these are going to be um, convenient for at-home use. Some of them are small enough to carry around, but um, it's definitely something they can use from home. And uh, you can put the, like, albuterol or there's other medications that you can, you can use for, like, controllers and things um, in here as well. But it just makes it a little bit easier to use. It usually takes a couple minutes to actually inhale all the vapor, but um, another option as well. 
Okay. And we'll go through, you know, the RESPA mat and some of those things um, another time when we talk about like COPD and stuff. But uh, just know that there's the other inhalers and the ones I just mentioned, obviously. Um, so some of these types of medications, we have our short acting beta-2 agonists or Saba. Um, all these asthma meds have these funny names, but Saba, um, we typically think of albuterol. So brand names like Proair, Ventolin, Proventil. Um, we also have uh, Levalbuterol, which is Zopinex. Um, we don't see that one nearly as often. Um, supposedly, it would help with some of the adverse effects um, compared to albuterol, but I don't. I haven't personally seen any data that shows that that's super needed. Um, but you know, there it is. Um, these are considered relievers or rescue inhalers, uh, which are going to open the airway within minutes of inhalation. Um, really, their peak is 30 to 60 minutes, and they potentially can last uh, four to six hours, although some people do end up needing them more uh, frequently than that during like an attack or something. <clears throat> Um, how they work, they're going to bind to those beta-2 adrenergic receptors. Um, that's going to increase that cyclic AMP, uh, which is going to result in that um, relaxation of the smooth muscle uh, in the bronchial. And it's going to also stop um, like any sort of like hypersensitivity mediators like mast cells, um, other inflammatory mediators, things like that. So you're um, more so, you know, helping with the, uh, the bronchial dilation, uh, but you can have some um, mediator inhibition as well. Some of the adverse effects, nervousness, um, tremor, tachycardia, palpitations, cough, hyperglycemia. Um, you know, this is really something we worry about with patients that are overly using their albuterol inhaler. They're using way more uh, doses than they should be. Um, they're not on a controller medication. Um, and, you know, it's, it's causing them to have some of these side effects. Usually if the person's using it truly as needed and they don't need it all that often, these side effects aren't going to be that big a deal. Um, but one of the things we want to make sure we monitor is how frequently they're actually using the inhaler. Um, once we start, you know, seeing more than like two or three times a week, um, two or three days per week, that's going to kind of indicate that they really do need to have another look at their medications because we probably need to add some, either something to control or a, uh, increase the dose of their control or add on a second control or whatever it may be. Um, but, you know, we, we definitely need to take a look at their uh, medication use. <clears throat> Um, we also have short-acting muscarinic antagonists um, anti or anticholinergics. So ipotropium or atrovent um, is the one that's inhaled. Now, this is typically used in COPD. Um, but, and if you think about it, you know, if you're getting, um, secretions, uh, from the, the lungs and the bronchioles and all that from the, you know, the particulate or whatever's causing the, uh, the increased mucus production, um, in COPD, your body's trying to get rid of that mucus. You can't get rid of it, so it produces more, and so you get this obstruction. Anticholinergic, in that sense, you know, kind of makes sense because we're reducing um, secretions of any kind of fluid or mucus or anything like that. Um, so it makes sense. Now, it doesn't make as much sense in asthma, but it is still used off-label quite a bit um, in asthma, especially when a patient comes in with, like, an exacerbation because you'll see things like Duoneb where it's uh, in combination with albuterol, and they'll give someone a nebulizer of that, you know, in the emergency room and, and treat that way. But it's, it's, uh, got about the same, um, onset and all that as, as the albuterol, but it's not going to be nearly as effective, especially as a single agent. So you'd want to use it in combo for sure. If you're going to use it in asthma, um, uh, the adverse effects though, just think anticholinergic side effects. So dry mouth, scratchy throat, things like that. All right, so we're going to look at uh, some of the inhaled corticosteroids, or ICS. Um, there's several here listed. Um, the This part of it really doesn't matter. I haven't seen anything that says, you know, this is, um, and so please don't quote me. If you know of any studies or anything like that that compare these head-to-head, -head, um, I'm all ears. Please send them to me. That'd be great. Uh, but I don't know of any in particular. It's usually just the dosing strategy that I kind of look for, so things like, you um, our annuity, which you can dose once a day, it seems to be even more convenient for people um, than things like Flovent, which is twice a day. And so, um, you know, things like that is kind of what I look for. Or the again, the device itself that it comes in. Um, our annuity comes in a so it's pretty easy. Um, 
So kind of use that. The uh, adverse effects um, that we think about with these um, dysphonia and also with thrush in the mouth um, is a big issue. So you want to make sure that these patients are uh, rinsing their mouth out after they uh, use their dose, um, rinse their mouth and then spit um, after each dose. Um, I've actually seen, uh, there's a case in the um, I see this the surgical and trauma ICU when I was a student, and uh, they had this guy that kept getting thrush like every few days, and it came to find out he was using Simbacort inhaler. Uh, they were giving him just two daily doses, not rinsing his mouth out at all, and so he the thrush would go away after like a day or two, and then he'd get it right back, and uh, they couldn't figure out why, and then they took the the steroid away, um, or at least were rinsing his mouth after the steroid, and then his thrush stopped happening. So um, it does uh, become an issue. Um, but again, double check um, when you are prescribing things like fluticasone that has two different formulations, make sure you're checking the directions or if the standard directions are two puffs, um, make sure you're aware of that so that you can get the dosing correct before you send the prescription. Um, or if you're a pharmacist, then make sure you're double checking that the provider did that correctly. All right, so another medication that we use as a controller is the uh, long-acting beta-2 agonist. So same concept as the Sabas, um, but these are going to be longer-acting. Um, one of the main uh, medications that we see in this class is Selmeterol, um, and uh, we'll talk about some other options in a minute, but... Um, Salmeterol is the one we see, uh, Cerevent discus. Um, now, these are supposed to be um, administered with a steroid. So they all have a black box warning. Um, so all the all the long-acting beta-2 beta agonists that are solo drugs that are by themselves are going to be, um, they're going to have black box warnings. And then um, the reason for that is because we see this uh, increase of asthma-related death, which is not what you want when you're treating asthma. Um, but they're never to be used as a reliever um, and should not be given without an ICS. So there's a study called the SMART trial that had over 26,000 patients where they compared some metanol to placebo. And um, they saw an increased number of deaths. There was 13 deaths in the semeterol group and only three deaths in the placebo. And they attributed that to the, um, the LABA being used by itself. Um, but we're gonna, I want you to remember that and we're going to come back to it when we look at the treatment uh, options and the preferred agents now. Because this, this kind of concept is what's throwing a lot of people off with the new guidelines. Um, what they found kind of after they made those black box warnings, because um, it used to be on anything that had an ICS in it, um, excuse me, a LABA, um, whether it had an ICS or not is a combo, um, it was it had this black box warning. So every like um, Advair, Simbacort, any of those drugs that have an ICS and a LABA in it um, all had this black box warning. Then they found that um, Vestry, uh, the, the Vestry trial showed that Salmeterol and fluticasone combo versus fluticasone um, in patients 4 to 11, um, the rate of asthma or adverse asthma related events was similar um, in both groups. And so they didn't see, um, you know, any big issue with that. Um, Austri trial showed kind of the same thing. And so what the FDA ended up doing is any uh, LABA that was in combination with an ICS was um, allowed to remove that black box warning. So the black box warning is still there on medications that are a LABA by itself, um, but not on the combination. Um, and we think mechanistically kind of what's going on is, you know, when we use the, the beta agonist, on uh, the long acting beta agonist, um, you know, the, the activity leads to this down regulation of beta receptors. So the concern was if you're using this long acting beta agonist and it's less staying on that receptor for a long period of time, you get this down regulation. If the person has an asthma attack, they go to the, the ED to get their albuterol to kind of open their lungs back up. There's nothing for, there's no receptors present then for the albuterol to bind to. And they've had patients that have died um, from that. But what we see is that the, and what was suggested by the studies, is that these corticosteroids sort of upregulate those beta receptors. So they kind of um, counteract each other. Um, studies also suggest that the um, lava can activate cortico, um, corticosteroid receptors and basically enhance the um, transcription of anti inflammatory mediators to where the corticosteroids can reduce that. Um, 
inflammation that's present. So they basically have this synergistic effect when you see an ICS used in combination with a long-acting beta agonist. Um, and that's why they've removed the black box warning um, after we've kind of proved this theory out and this, this mechanism out in those trials. So just to give you um, a few more examples, so we've already talked to, I said Simbicort. Um, there's also Advair, uh, which went generic recently. There is Dulera, and there is Brio Ellipta, um, just to name a few. There's others as well, but those are all ICS and LABA combinations. And then um, the big thing with this is if you're using this for a controller, you know, make sure that the patient's insurance um, has one of the agent that you pick on formulary. And then also, again, double check the dosing and directions. To give you an example, Simbacord is two puffs twice a day. So if you're using it, um, you know, one puff twice a day, you may not be getting the full effect or the full dose of the medication. So you got to keep, keep that in mind. Um, also, you want to, uh, again, be aware of the device that the inhaler comes in. That's going to be important as well. All right, so um, another thing that we have not used nearly as often, um, but still out there, is the leukotriene modifying agents. So we have things like Montelukast, Singulair. Um, we also have uh, Acolyte and Zyflo. Those two have not used nearly as often, but um, you'll, still, you'll still see Singulair here and there. Um, some of the warnings to watch out for, things like um, neuropsychiatric events, mood changes. It's a low risk, but it can happen. Um, you do want to uh, monitor LFTs with um, Acolyte, and um, adverse effects that we would see with these would be things like headache, dizziness, um, maybe some abdominal pain. Um, and then Montelukast is approved for as young as one year old, studied down to six months, and uh, it's available as like these granules that uh, you can dissolve in like five mLs of formula, or mixed with like you know applesauce or some sort of baby food, and they can take it that way. So leukotriene modifying agents, Montelukast is the one to really be aware of. And we're going to talk about these in much more detail when we get to COPD, but there is also a long-acting muscarinic antagonist or anticholinergic, um, the LAMA, and the one that's approved in uh, for asthma is teotropium or the Spiriva respimat. Um, know that there is two different um, doses of Spiriva, and to make sure that you're using the correct one, um, because there's one that's for asthma, and there's a higher dose that's used in COPD, and there's come as two separate um, inhalers, two separate boxes, so make sure you're writing for the correct prescription. Um, the uh, evidence that we have available shows that teotropium, when you add it to like a standard combination therapy, does improve asthma symptoms. But we always want to consider an ICS and then um, an ICS LABA first um, before kind of adding this on. Um, and again, there's two different Spiriva doses, so make sure you get the right one. Omalizumab, or Zolaire, um, is a monoclonal antibody. Um, it's designed to inhibit IgE binding um, at the IgE receptor, um, specifically on mast cells and basophils. And this is really going to be indicated for patients that have a moderate to severe, like persistent allergic asthma. So um, patients that are six years of age or older, they have to have a skin test that's positive to an, an allergen um, and uh, symptoms controlled with their ICS has to be inadequate in order for them to even be a candidate for this. Typically, we're going to save these for absolutely last line. But if a person's asthma is being exacerbated because of the type of allergen, um, this may be a good option. Um, it does have a black box warning for anaphylaxis. So this is given subcutaneously every two to four weeks in a healthcare setting under medical supervision um, due to that risk. And then there is a slight increased risk of cardiovascular events that we've seen kind of post-market and um, more adverse effects uh, that we would kind of more common adverse effects, injection site reactions we would expect, um, you know, some pain, dizziness, things like that, maybe even fatigue. Um, and then know that it is weight-based dosed as well as um, IgE levels. So it's based on um, both of those factors to kind of figure out what dose the patient will get. There are also uh, medications in a class called interleukin-5 receptor antagonists, um, so things like Nucala, uh, but they're basically patients that have asthma um, as well as eosinophilic phenotype. Um, then basically these are, these are used to um, help kind of 
you know, in patients that have sort of like this under um, underlying active type two um, immune process happening, um, you know, they can, if they basically if the clinical trials have showed that levels of eosinophils between 200 and 300 um, show that the patient probably has this underlying condition. And so using one of these um, interleukin-5 receptor antagonists can help um, with some of that um, type two reaction. And so the, um, and then allow the other medications like the ICS and the LAVAs to do, um, their work more effectively. So, um, those are something that's more specialty. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can control with our other standard medications before we have to go that route. But, um, there are definitely patients who will need, um, to be on more, more, um, special medication. All right, let's go back through this algorithm real quick. And um, the first thing that I want you to kind of be aware of is the um, change from using a albuterol as a rescue inhaler. So see that um, on here, the preferred reliever, we have other options as the uh, you know alternative, and that's where albuterol lives now is this alternative to their preferred agent. So what they prefer now is specifically the low-dose ICS and formoterol, and that's used um, as needed. So that is completely contra like, um, contrary to what we've normally thought for, I mean, years and years and years. So we've always say you can't use a, an ICS, you can't use a LABA um, as needed. You have to use them every day regardless of how you feel, blah, 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 blah. So now they're changing it up on us, and they're basically saying, we want you to use a low-dose ICS and formoterol um, as needed uh, instead of the albuterol. And at first when I saw this, I thought that was insane, but the more that I kind of read through um, the, the studies and that the, they quoted for getting this, this change um, approved, and when I looked at the kinetics, so formoterol actually has an onset of action that is very similar to albuterol. So even though technically it is a long-acting beta agonist, um, it actually has a very short onset. So it'll last longer, but you get the same be baso uh, or um, bronchial diagnosis dilation that you would with albuterol. So that's the first thing. And that's why they're specific about formoterol. Um, ICS, the reason why I think that's good is because, um, it, like I said at the beginning, this is an inflammation problem. And so if we are giving something to reduce the inflammation as well as opening up uh, the bronchioles, that, that's something that's going to hopefully help the patient breathe quicker. Um, and they've studied it directly against albuterol now. And found that um, you know the the low dose ICS and formoterol combo actually reduces the amount of uh, exacerbations per year um, in the patient's uh, overall quality. So it's definitely one of those things that it's contrary to what we think, but it the more you kind of look at it, it makes sense. And we actually have data now supporting it. And so um, I know like in my clinic, we've had situations where you know patient couldn't afford um, two inhalers. So they had the albuterol and uh, they needed to be on a controller, like a low-dose ICS, but they couldn't afford it. And so we ended up switching them to Symbacort because in our clinic, we have Symbacort available for the same price as albuterol because um, it's 340B and all that. And so um, the patient switched to the Symbacort as needed and ended up having uh, much better control of their asthma. So so um, there's been cases, we've had several patients that have been switching over to this now, um, and it seems to be working well for us, but, um, you know, just kind of be aware that's the new preferred reliever is Symbacort um, or Dolera is the other one that has Formoterol in it. Um, so step one for controlling symptoms. So this is something that patients, again, will use uh, every day once you get into step two and higher. Um, step one is still as needed. So it's just basically using that reliever, just like you would with before with albuterol. Um, you're using it as needed, and then it's not necessarily scheduled, but uh, as they start to increase the frequency of their use, then we move on to step two. Um, step two, we're basically wanting to uh, use a um, low dose inhaled corticosteroid by itself. Um, you could again use the rescue inhaler, the Symbacore if you needed to, um, but preferably you'd use the uh, low dose inhaled corticosteroid every day. And then if the person still needed a uh, rescue inhaler, then you would um, give them the Symbacore as needed. So you can use two different types of 
steroid. So the ICS that's in them with the Simbicor, with the Formoterol, um, and then a low-dose, uh, whatever ICS you want, um, low-dose by itself daily. So don't let the two um, ICSs throw you off either because that's the other thing that looks a little weird. Um, when you move on to step three, that's when you can move to a low-dose ICS plus a LABA. Um, an alternative to that would be um, using like a medium dose ICS by itself. Um, most people will go and use like an Advair or something. But again, still, if you notice at the bottom, this is still uh, the preferred as needed low dose ICS for Motorola. Um, you know, that's that's what they're used um, uh, in main for for maintenance of uh, or for as needed rather, even though they have maintenance therapy with um, like an ICS or LABA. For step four, um, we have medium dose ICS plus LABA. So this is where um, you could potentially use high dose ICS by itself, but by this point, um, you most likely would use um, the high the ICS LABA by itself, or the combo rather, instead of trying to just continue to increase the dose of the ICS. Um, you also could potentially consider adding on teotropium to like a the, whatever the ICS you were using, um, you could also use um, the leukotriene receptor agonist if you needed to use that. Um, and so there's other options you can do um, in adding on to whatever you were using in step three, but um, most likely we can just increase the dose of whatever ICS LABA they were on or switch or add on the LABA if they weren't already and control the symptoms that way. Once you hit step five, um, that's where we encourage you to use a high dose ICS or LABA. Um, and then you would also want to get phenotypic assessment done and then see if the person has any, um, you know, phenotypic uh, signals that would, would lead you to using so like one of the, um, the, IG, the anti-IgE or anti-interleukin-5 um, medications. Um, you could also consider adding on teotropium as a add-on therapy as well and uh, go from there. But um, the big thing is going to be cost, whether or not they have um, any type of like genetic variation that it would require them to do that, or you would want to block that, like that type two reaction. Um, and then you would also want to uh, assess for, you know, how they're using the inhaler and go through all that stuff, um, you know, as you're kind of working your way through this algorithm. And then make sure that uh, the patient can afford the medications as well. Um, don't send them off with uh, three different inhalers that are all brand names and then, you know, not make sure that they got the medication. Um, so they make it get to the pharmacy and not be able to afford it. So, uh, make sure that you're kind of looking over that, but again, um, take home points. We're using the as needed low dose ICS and Fomoterol as a rescue inhaler now instead of albuterol. And then, um, we're kind of going fr uh, from there, um, using low dose I ICS daily and then escalating, um, forward if we need it for control. Um, and then the other thing that this guidelines talks about is that if a patient is um, doing well and they're not having any problems, not having exacerbations, their asthma is controlled, we want to de-escalate therapy. So you'd want to move um, down a, to this previous step and then stay there for a little bit, see how they do. If they still are completely fine, de-escalate again. Um, they want you to move down as many steps as possible um, until you know the patient starts having issues, then, you know, keep them there or move them back up if you need to. But um, they do want you to de-escalate. They don't want you to put a patient on high dose ICS and just leave them on there for the rest of their lives. Um, we want to limit their exposure to that if possible. So um, that's my little review of asthma. If you have questions, shoot me an email and uh, hope that was somewhat helpful. Thanks.